China down to Texas and, and across the mid-Atlantic through Ohio. And then I basically say you, our wheat states come right up the I-35 corridor. Uh, you get into Minneapolis and then you just start heading west and, and go out through the Dakotas, Montana, and then you get out to the Pacific Northwest with Idaho, Washington, and, and Oregon, uh, all major players and producers uh, of wheat. And so we are their uh, sound and their, uh, their representatives uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, not only to the Capitol Hill, to the administration as well on trade issues and domestic issues, but also to other uh, commodity organizations and, and coalitions. So what are some of the biggest issues and concerns uh, for wheat growers in 2020? Well, I mean, COVID is clearly, COVID-19 is clearly a major issue that we're working with. Um, you know, as we continue to see what's happening in the meat sector you know, uh, with so many of the plants where they're having illnesses and, and they're, they're having to slow their speed lines down, you know, we're very actively working with our supply chain as well as the USDA and the US Congress to make sure that we don't see any disruptions in that supply chain. Uh, you know, we, we're about to start harvesting wheat in the southern part of the country uh, around Texas. And then every week we just slowly move north, you know, 30 to 50 miles. And, and by this fall, you know, we'll, we'll be all the way up to the Canadian border. And so making sure that we have got not only a healthy blockchain of, of, of workers, we've got to also make sure uh, our colleagues in the, mill, in the mills and at the bakers are all in, in, in uh, good health. And so that's caused some price volatility and it's caused a lot of concern on getting input. You know, what are you gonna do if you're, uh, if you're a dealer down the road where you buy your seed and buy your crop protection tools? What if they're closed because of, of an illness or something along those lines? Or what if you can't get your fertilizer delivered? Because it's, you know, really it's past time for prepping your fields. And so we've been working very actively uh, with the USDA and with Congress to make sure agriculture was deemed essential, which it was to make sure our farmers and ranchers were deemed essential because they supply uh, you know, the food to America and to the rest of the world. And just to continue to make sure if there are any little upsets somewhere in that supply chain, uh, that we're the first to know about it and that we can lend relief, whether it be through one of the congressional packages or some of the existing programs that we already have at the USDA. Hmm. So, so how are the low prices right now? And we can look at a graph that you have here. So how are they really affecting uh, the growers? You know, low prices, do, low prices do two things. So what you're looking at here is actually just a very narrow uh, band from December 31st to uh, about April 15th. And you can see the volatility here. And like I said, we have six classes of wheat, but this is looking at, at hard red winter wheat. And you can see that the future price, I mean, really took a tumble as we started to head into uh, the 1st of March. And then as the COVID situation came into place um, and we started seeing more stay at home uh, issued by the government. And, and, you know, there's really no other word for it. There was panic buying going on, just like they do on the coast when a hurricane's coming in. You can see where we see that slight spike up there in the futures price in wheat. And so I, I, I want to talk about this, this, this price and the volatility on two different issues. Um, if we could, I'd first like to start with the, with the CPAP program. Uh, that the USDA is currently working on and, and putting out. They have not put out the full regulations yet of how or what commodities will be eligible. But my biggest concern that I've got from speaking to many of the officials at the USDA is they are taking a snapshot from basically March 15th to roughly April 15th, or maybe March 1st to April 15th, uh, to look at your futures price to determine if your commodity is going to be eligible for that program. Well, as you just saw there, because of panic buying, uh, the wheat futures went up just a little bit, and it went up just enough that I don't think that wheat growers are going to qualify. So that's very troubling, being the largest food grain grown here in the United States, that they're going to take that narrow picture, while when you looked at the rest of that graph, you saw those prices were just heading straight down, and then that's what, the, and they're actually heading back down again, but that's not the snapshot that the government is currently looking at. So that tail keeps on going back down uh, for the rest of the futures price. So that's a major impact there. Uh, I, and I'm happy to stop there, but then I'd also like to talk about how this, plants, uh, how this affects planting decisions as we move into this next cropping season. Absolutely. Is there a, is there a slide with that or? Well, you know what, that, that one, with the, that one with, the, with the US on it, we can talk about that there. Sure. So, you know, as, as the wheat price continues to drop, you know, farmers are looking at margins, they're looking at what can they do, uh, where can they make a profit, 
Uh, a lot of our growers uh, live and, and, and grow wheat in other areas where they either rotate with corn and soybeans or maybe they can grow other crops like cotton. But then as you move up there in that, that Pacific Northwest over there around Idaho, Oregon, yes, Washington, um, wheat is the only thing they can grow. That's in a very dry, arid, desert region, region uh, low rainfall, uh, high winds, I mean, a pretty rough area, but wheat thrives out there. And so for a lot of those producers, uh, these rotation crops uh, are, are not an option for them. And as the price of wheat continues to drop, you know, farmers are, are businessmen. As a matter of fact, the price of the best businessmen that we have in the United States, they're going to look at what is my margin on wheat going to look like and what's my margin on possibly corn or soybeans going to look like. And so if the price of wheat does not start to go back up and stabilize, I think we could continue to see uh, a decrease in planted acres of wheat and they're going to be substituted uh, not only with corn and soy, uh, especially since they have access to biotechnology and are able to grow further north and displace a lot of our wheat acres, but uh, it's going to make it a, a very difficult decision for our growers to move forward if we can't find a way to either increase our international markets to bring these prices up or increase domestic demand or what would be best for us is if we could do actually both of those things at one time. <laughs> So speaking of international markets, how has the kind of tenuous relationship with China impacted growers? Well, so when the, when the trade war with China first started, um, we did not sell wheat to China for almost two years. I and mean, that was a little over uh, a billion dollars that we lost just in the wheat industry. I mean, they're a major player. There's, there's over a, a, a billion people in the country of, of China. Um, and so, so that was a major hit to us. And, and, and the MFP payments or market facilitation program that the uh, USDA came out with, uh, it helped, but uh, it was clearly geared more towards soybeans than it was to the wheat growers, even though we definitely could demonstrate an economic loss. When, when China uh, fulfills their WTO requirements, along with their phase one requirements of this deal that we've just signed, uh, that would make China our third largest export market, Mexico being our first. And so this phase one deal is extremely important to us. It's also very important to us, though, that China be held accountable for that WTO case they lost for the internal subsidies they were given to their own wheat growers to make sure we're on a level playing field. So things are getting better, but wheat has definitely, be, has definitely been significantly impacted before that trade war. And again, fingers crossed that this phase one continues They've already bought 340,000 uh, metric tons of wheat from us this year. So remember I said the previous two years, they bought none. That's roughly 12 and a half million bushels. I, I like to think of bushels, not metric tons. That's a little confusing. But um, so we're on the path, we're on the right path with China. The question is going to be, will they maintain their phase one path and will they uphold their TRQ? Hmm. So, you know, looking at the weather patterns, I know right now here in the Mid-Atlantic, it's been cold this weekend. And I know some places in the Midwest, uh, Oklahoma, some of the places, and we talked about this last week with Steve uh, a little bit uh, about the frost and about the cold, you know, weather impacting wheat. And you know, what are you hearing from farmers out there that, you know, how is the wheat looking? Yeah, so I, I specifically called my uh, uh, board members in, in Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas as we were watching that cold weather come up and you know, I don't know what's going on. I've lived in D.C. for 20 years. I don't, we got down to 33 the other night here. I mean, I've, I've never seen weather uh, like that up here. Now, I know the, the Great Plains gonna still have sn uh, cold snaps this late in the year, but uh, I know in Oklahoma, uh, the, the, the wheat report was really good. Uh, and then after that freeze came through, we're looking at about 40% damage. Um, it really depends on where your wheat was in the process. If it had already come out, came out let me get my words back under me. If it had already come out of the boot and it was starting to head, uh, you had damage. If your wheat was flowering, it died. It, it died. Mm -hmm. um, if you were still pre-flowering uh, pre and still in that boot stage, which a little further north that you went, um, there was still some damage, but really Texas, Oklahoma saw the brunt of that. But, you know, we're having cold weather right now again, and, and that wheat's continuing to grow. If we have another cold snap like that, we're going to really hit the heart of the wheat belt of that I-35 corridor uh, for, for, for this planting season or for, or for this winter wheat that's supposed to be coming off. Mm. Well, wow, those are some challenging times for the growers there in, in that part of the country, which uh, I guess it's kind of par for the course, right? It is. But you know what? Uh, we can't control the weather. 
But that is the reason that the Farm Bill is so important that we pass that every five to six years because that is a risk management uh, bill. People can talk about it however they want and, and the nutrition component is on there, which is also very important. But the Farm Bill offers programs for revenue and price protection. It offers crop insurance for disasters like the weather that we were just discussing. You know, if it wasn't for the conservation programs in the Farm Bill, we would be looking at another dust bowl again. And so when we have these challenging times in agriculture, which many times can be back to back years, it is the Farm Bill and those programs that keep our farmers and growers uh, still able to keep their head above water, to keep producing that wheat, and to keep making sure you've got bread and other products in your grocery stores. Mm. What do you say to those consumers who are kind of kind of playing the devil that you kind of but the okay now I can't get my words out the devil's advocate saying well these rich farmers why do they need subsidies from the government you know uh, and we do get that and 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 the first thing that goes through my mind I probably shouldn't say on on the media on the <laughs> day anyway is you clearly do not understand agriculture and I'm guessing the only thing you've ever raised was a tomato in your backyard um you know, this is the example I like to give, and I'm just picking on Geico, but just because I like their commercials. Mm -hmm. You know, Geico comes in, and let's just take a city, let's take the city of Chicago. There's roughly 4 million people that live in Chicago. Let's say every one of those 4 million people in Chicago held a Geico policy. Geico, to be, a, uh, uh, to be actuarially sound, knows statistically all four million of those drivers are not going to have a wreck on the exact same day. They know that. That's how they make money. Well, you can't take that same model and spread it out across 50 states and large geographical areas where maybe you have an early freeze or a late freeze in western Kansas and then you have a hurricane come over here and hit, and hit North Carolina and all of it was during you know, planting or, or harvest of the, of, of the wheat or any other crop, actually. And the only entity that is large enough to underwrite an insurance policy for something that could cover multiple states is the federal government. And so, and I think the other key things that when people make statements like that, they don't realize farmers pay a premium, just like you pay a premium on your car insurance these farmers are paying a premium for their crop insurance. So, so they've got skin in the game. This is not a free handout. And the programs are specifically designed to make sure that it is not a revenue program. It's just to make sure you don't go out of business. And so when you explain the car insurance and all 4 million people crashing at the same time, I hope that gives uh, the viewers and the consumers and those who are six and seven generations removed from their food source a little better understanding of why we need these important programs. Mm. So another thing that agriculture brings, and you have this slide here that, that talks about the, the direct food and, and, and agricultural jobs uh, that are presented from, from farmers, right? So I'm going to bring this slide up and I'll have you chat about that for a little bit. Sure. Here. So uh, and while you're bringing that up, each year, uh, the National Wheat Foundation, um, which uh, closely works with uh, NOG, we're a member of it, we put on this program here in Washington, D.C. for the congressional staff called Wheat. Well, this year will be Wheat 105. Each year we raise the number. I'm hoping, I'm hoping they're learning something each time they come to our event. But, um, you know, one of the things we put out, and I want to thank our friends at the American Farm Bureau for this great slide and, and uh, always letting us use it. But what a lot of people don't realize is agriculture and the wheat industry uh, directly and, and indirectly uh, supplies 23 million jobs in the United States. And then when you look here at this, uh, at this particular map, you know, the ones in the red are, are greater than 8% and the, the dark blue is 7 to 8% and the light blue is 7%. But you're looking at the entire United States. Uh, uh, every state is dependent on some type of either agriculture commodity, livestock, seafood, fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, every one of these states, GDP, is, is dependent on a productive and safe agriculture system. And it takes people to drive those trucks to go get those commodities, to take it to the elevator, to take it to the miller, and then the miller turns it into flour and ships it to the baker. And all those people in those fa factories and processing plants packaging those goods and then sending them to a distribution center so that you can go to your local grocery store and select that item uh, off the shelf or through Amazon or wherever your retailer is. 
Uh, agriculture supports 23 million jobs. And again, going back to that risk management bill of the farm bill, which catches a lot of flack sometimes from like uh, the environmental working group and, and the Heritage Foundation, not wanting to support our family farmers and ranchers. You need to turn that around and we need to make sure you understand the farm bill and agriculture is a jobs bill and, and, and creates jobs for 23 million uh, Americans. And some of those jobs have been impacted by COVID. And that's, I think, and you can probably explain this better, why some of the, the supply chain has been disrupted getting some products to grocery stores, right? Yes. You know, um, so we've, there's a couple mills that have been shut down due to illnesses within their plants. And, and I know there's been at least one very large bakery that has been shut down. We are not being hit near as hard as the meat industry. And I really feel sorry for for our, our colleagues. I used to do livestock uh, issues when I worked on the House Agriculture Committee, so they're, they're very near and dear to my heart, but we have to make sure that we maintain a healthy supply chain, and that means transportation, that means the mills, that means the bakers, and you know, I think the other thing that's really interesting too, um, and, and, I, and I know we were probably going to discuss this, and, and since we're talking about the pandemic and the supply chain, when you go to your grocery store, just because there's no more flour, can't find wheat, and you can't find bread, can't find frozen pizzas, you can't find bagels. There's still plenty of wheat out here. We've got plenty of it. <laughs> but, you, but you have to remember, by the time you get it to the miller and the millers are going, you know, the millers are having to do a major change. You know, most millers package their flour uh, to go to, to large bulk buyers like restaurants or, or colleges and universities, people who are buying thousands and thousands of pounds of flour. Well, now that, the, now that the restaurants are shut down in a lot of the major cities, they're having to reconfigure and repackage. And how do we get more of that product to the grocery stores? No one is going to go to a grocery store and buy 100 pounds of flour, but they will go and buy five pounds of flour. And so the system is catching up with the change. But, but we've got plenty of wheat out there. But this is the other reason that we've got to make sure that we take the appropriate steps during COVID so that we can flatten these curves because we cannot afford for those individuals in those mills and bakers and, and those truck drivers and custom harvesters for them to become ill because then we will have a problem in this supply chain worse than what we're already seeing in some other commodities. Yeah, if we start losing our, our farmers, then we're all in trouble, right? I mean, no farms, no food. <laughs> Not our saying, I know that's an American Farmland Trust, but I still have that bumper sticker and it's <laughs> Also, no farm, no beer. So you might want to keep that in mind too. <laughs> hey, you got to have your beer, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what are some of the issues that NOG, and you talked about this a little bit, but what are some of the issues that NOG is bringing to members of Congress? And is Congress still, uh, are they approachable during COVID times? Almost, uh, yes, they are. I mean, uh, either myself or someone on our NOG team is in constant communication. Right now, we're mostly talking, of course, to the House and Senate Agriculture Committee. Uh, especially as the House of Representatives is starting to look at their fourth package to make sure that we've had everybody covered. We've still had some issues with the Paycheck Protection Program and some of uh, uh, farmers and ranchers being eligible for that and, and just what needs to be in that next program. So Congress and, and their staff have been extremely accessible uh, when they're all in the same position with us here in D.C., still under lockdown until uh, sometime next week. And then, you know, if we took COVID off, I'd like to just take COVID off and just sit it over here. It's hard. Wouldn't we all? Right? <laughs> yeah, kind of done with that. Um, but you know, we we are working on some tax issues. Uh, you know, major infrastructure bills are being considered in Congress right now. And and when I was on the Hill, and that was more than a decade ago, I remember I worked on locks and dams. And it's not only locks and dams. And then this is just one example. I mean, our highways and our rail and uh, everything needs a major overhaul. We. This country sadly has neglected its infrastructure. I mean, think back in Minneapolis when that when that bridge mm -hmm. fell down, and that was so so traumatic, and it was caught on camera. Um, you would be very surprised driving across the country trying to move food from one point to the next. How deteriorated our infrastructure is, and so uh, getting those locks and dams fixed on the Mississippi, uh, getting the Columbia River, you know, that heads out to the ports there. Uh, in between Washington and Oregon. That's a major export market for wheat. Uh, and just focusing on how can we become more efficient here in the United States, because the margins on our farmers are getting smaller and smaller, and infrastructure and transportation costs has got to be our next major focus outside, of course, the Farm Bill and other agriculture legislation and, and priorities. Hmm. 
What are some of the other uh, impacts that COVID has had on NOG, especially for you know, coming events and things like that? Have you guys canceled events? Have you, you postponed events? What's happening with that? So we, uh, we've we already had our two meetings uh, earlier this year. We had our winter meeting here in D.C. And then, of course, we went to Commodity Classic because we're one of the owners of that show. Um, our next uh, in face, uh, face-to-face meeting is going to be this fall in. I'm supposed to know the dates. October. Let's just pick them up. It's in October. Um, <laughs> uh, in Phoenix, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So the U.S. Wheat Associates, which I know you had Steve Mercer on uh, last week, and then NOG, that's where we come together and meet. As of right now, that meeting is still... Uh, fully planned to go. Uh, we're hoping that, you know, we can get this, these curves flattened and, and get it to where we can start having large gatherings again. So we're not going to cancel uh, that meeting until we absolutely have to. But I also have to put a little uh, word out and, and, and congratulate my board of directors. You know, the average age of the farmer now is 58 and going up. It is not going down. And, and we've had our entire board on Zoom and have conducted some very technical business. And so uh, we are making do and moving forward. And, and I have a slide to show here, right? Sir? I have a slide to put up here, is this? Oh yes, these are my officers, yes. Oh, okay. so, uh, this is our current national officers. Um, uh, Dave Milligan from Cass City, Michigan is our president. Uh, Nicole Berg is our vice president for Patterson, Washington. Uh, Brent Shane, our treasurer from Klamath Falls, Oregon. And then our newly elected secretary, Keith Felty from uh, Atlas, Oklahoma. And then our past president, Ben Scholes from Levon, Texas. And so this is our current slate of our executive team. And I talk to them at least two, at least once a week, if not twice a week. But our full board is 41 members, plus all the state executives, plus the small NOG staff. There's only five of us now. And so it's still pretty interesting to try to try to have a board meeting, but you know what? We, we, we've gotten a lot better at it and, and we're still able to conduct the business on behalf of the wheat growers and we're still able to fully represent them and provide all of their membership benefits, whether it be through our communication tree or our, our social media platforms that we're working on. And then of course, all the letters that we've worked on with the governors, essential workers, and the different programs that the USDA and Congress have rolled out during this trying period. Mm-hmm. What's one thing that you really would like the general consumer to know and understand about wheat growers in America? I think the most important thing that that we can tell the consumer is not only are whole grains an essential part of a healthy diet, and I don't care where you go or what dietitian, and that's a key word, go talk to a dietitian, don't go talk to your trainer, don't go talk to your neighbor, and don't talk, talk to your neighbor's cat about what you need to be eating. You need to actually go talk to a dietitian, and they will tell you whole grains are an important part of your food. And the other thing I will tell you about the U.S. wheat grower, I mean, they are out there determined and produce the safest uh, crop and availability at the lowest cost to the consumer that they possibly can. We, the reason the U.S. wheat growers and our international market is so strong is because we literally grow the best wheat in the world. It is in the highest demand in the Asian Pacific realm. And if you know anything about trade with Japan they are and, and South Korea, they are extremely picky about what they will and will not let into that country. And U.S. wheat has always been allowed in there. And, and, and of the wheat that we produce and grow in the U.S., 50% of it is exported, but 50% of that safe, healthy product stays right here and we eat it in America. Hmm. And I've had the privilege of traveling across America and seeing many of those areas of uh, where, where wheat is grown to, uh, through my documentary film and, and uh, just the privilege of meeting many of these wheat growers from northern Montana to uh, the Palouse in Washington to uh, uh, down in Texas and, and all parts in between. It was uh, a really uh, amazing, I mean, amazing part of the country. Yes. Where these where these huge wheat fields, and of course, right here in Maryland, where I live, they grow wheat as well. <laughs> so we did our first congressional tour to one of our board members, uh, Eric Spates, lives right up here, forty five minutes out of D.C., and and he saved us uh, about five acres of that because his wheat was ready, and we took nineteen congressional staff out there, and a lot of them have definitely actually never seen wheat in the field. I mean, they've seen it on TV, and you know, seen the combines going across the field, but I actually took them out there and they got to uh, ride in the combine and watch that wheat get harvested and, and, and really understand 
that this is the beginning of where bread and all of our wheat products come from. And something I really enjoyed about your movie, uh, and I even wrote it down here that I think is just so key, is that three-fourths of all of the U.S. grain products come from wheat flour. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. And I know that's in, at the beginning and in, in your trailer up for your movie there, but I think that's such a key, important fact that it is a healthy product that we continue to put on the table. And, uh, you know, 50% of it stays here and we, we enjoy what we do. Well, it's, it's evident. So I want to, uh, this, this question isn't on my cue sheet that I sent you, but uh, what is the favorite, what is the favorite part about your job and what you do? You know, it's, it's the same thing that I've been so fortunate to be able to do in all of my jobs here in D.C. Um, to be honest, when I moved to Washington, I did not move here to work for Democrats or Republicans. I really didn't care. Um, I came up here to work in agriculture policy. I grew up in 4-H at FFA. I grew up in a small town, Morgan Mill, Texas. I had to drive into Stephenville, Texas. That was the metropolitan area, of, you know, 15,000 for me to go to high school and, and then went down to a and 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 I wanted to, and my granddad was a county extension agent. My dad worked for Sagenta. My mom worked for the extension service as well. So I mean, this was just kind of bred into me of what I was gonna end up doing. And I think my most, the thing I enjoy the most is when I go up to the hill or my NOG team goes up to the hill or to the administration and we get a change, whether it's a change in crop insurance or a change in the Title I program or a change in how we can better use a conservation program to preserve soil and water and still grow a healthy, affordable commodity like wheat, knowing that my team and I were able to make those changes are directly improving the lives of American wheat farmers. That's what makes my job fun. Hmm. So what's the next big thing for NOG? Well, uh, appropriations, I'd like, we'd like to get the government funded. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good, <laughs> right? Um, appropriations is our, our next big thing. And then as I mentioned, uh, infrastructure, um, trade will always be at the very top. Um, looking at the UK agreement that's coming up, though Kenya, uh, the free trade agreement that the administration uh, announced with them, not going to be a huge market for wheat, but it is going to set the precedence and the tone for the additional free trade agreements that I think are going to come uh, to other African countries. And there is a lot of potential for U.S. wheat exports. So if I had to say not in priority order, trade, infrastructure, appropriation, and then a couple of tax issues that we've got running around out there. Well, it sounds like you have your hands full and you're a busy man and, and the work you do uh, in Washington, D.C. Thank you for uh, doing what you do to help all of us uh, have a healthy and sustainable diet uh, that we can live uh, the life that we live here in America. We appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. I want to encourage everybody who is watching this live feed. Um, I know you can rent it on Amazon because I rented it again to watch it again, but the American, uh, the great American wheat harvest is fantastic. You know, it, it's got a, a lot of just the down to earth farmers that I work with every day in that program also talks about the complexities of how hard it is. You know, you don't just go put seed in the ground. I think we had someone say that a couple of months ago and that it go over very well. And that doesn't turn into bread in your grocery store. So uh, there's a lot of steps that go into there and, and I, I, excellent movie. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to come on your show and to talk about the, the U.S. wheat growers and our industry today. Yeah, thank you. So where can people get in contact with you guys? How can they, uh, how can they reach you guys? Definitely. Uh, so you can always find us on our website at Wheat World. That's one word, wheatworld.org. Uh, and there it's got our contact information. If you have educational opportunities, you can also find us, um, and it links to here through our National Wheat Foundation. But yes, contact us uh, right there where you were on the website. And then, of course, we've just got some other clips. And you can see the staff and then um, our policy and actions um, and just some basic facts on there that uh, will tell you a little bit more about the wheat industry. You know, and if you're really new and interested and, and really don't know a lot about wheat, I'd encourage you to go to that Wheat 101 tab. It just gives you a couple basic, um, yeah, it gives you a couple basic things about wheat and bread and, of course, those 23 million jobs that we support um, and, and just what it actually takes to get uh, the, the research and the genetics and to get that product all the way to the consumer. Very good. Well, uh, they also have a Facebook page. You can hop awesome. over to uh, 
the Wheat World Facebook yes. page. Yes, please and, come. Uh, please come like our page. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram and on Twitter. And so uh, if you want to keep up with what we're up to, we've got an excellent uh, social media platform. And so we're push, we push out recipes. We push out issues that are going on in the industry, of course, keeping you up on trade. And, and then our activities on Capitol Hill, all of our press releases and things that we're commenting on publicly uh, will show up on those three platforms. And, and we'd love to have you come follow us. And again, uh, if you ever have any questions, that's what we're here for is to represent the wheat industry and never hesitate to re uh, contact us. And Chandler, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for taking time to out of your busy schedule to talk to us. And uh, thanks for plugging the great American wheat harvest. I want to just show everybody the page here real quick where they can go and you can, uh, you can stream it on Amazon Prime or on Vimeo. If you're, if you're across the world someplace and you're not in the UK or in the US, you can stream it on Vimeo. And I still have a few DVDs. So if you want to order a DVD, I'll ship you a couple of DVDs. So you can order it right there on our website, greatamericanwheatharvest.com is the site. So uh, Chandler Gould, thank you for coming on the program tonight. And uh, we wish you to uh, good health and that you would stay healthy and keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I enjoyed being on your show and, and stay safe and we'll all get through this. And if you're at the store, buy some bagels, buy some flour, we'll make more. Absolutely. Sorry. There's plenty, there's plenty of wheat out there. There's plenty of wheat. <laughs> Just keep buying. We've got plenty of wheat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the live show is...